Americans are clapping going on. Oh, these mics aren't working. All right. Can you see? It works? There we go. It works. I'm Adam. Come on. Give me some noise in the crowd. Let's go. All right. I don't have a joke yet. Hold on. Give me five, five seconds. Five seconds. All right. All right. What do you call? What do you call? Yeah, I don't got a joke right now. I couldn't think of one. Now where my Sigma mail? <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh huh. There's three different cuffs. Adam, how many cuffs are there? There's three. I, there's nine. There's nine. There's nine. All right. So all you gotta do is put that cup at the edge of the table. Adam, what do they gotta do, bro? They gotta flip the cup. And it has to land back on this Woo! side, right here, right here, this side. Once you flip the cup, then you'll move on to the next size. Wait. And once you flip the last cup, you will Wait, win how, against how do we the flip other it? How do we flip it? All you gotta do is, bro, you just flip it. On dog. the edge or like, like no, this? No, you just flip it. Dog. On the edge? Uh, oh, you're right. Or like this. You gotta hit it from the bottom. Yeah, that's why. You I can thought. only use one hand. Adam, how many hands can they use? Two. No, fool. One hand? One hand. One hand. All right, now. Like that. Adam, can it land like this, dog? No. No, get that out of it here. It must land bottoms, no, top down. Yeah. I almost said a different now, that's thing. That's about it. Uh, can we get three people up here? Three people. Adam, Adam, choose this side. Three people. Did I say you'll win Starbucks if you get it, too? Show me your best dance move. Show me your best dance move. Come on. OK. Whoever's uh -huh. in the back over there. Whoever's in the back. Homegirl in the back. Whoever's in the back. Whoever's in the back. Go get him. What are you doing? Interesting. Who wants to go? Is there anyone new? One of you. One of you. Is there anyone new? All right, Who come on up. Let's go. Come on up. Come on up. Come on. We got one more back here. Come on. Let's go. Woo! Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, how many we got? How many we got? One more. One more. We need one more person. One more. We need one more person. Okay, come on up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, can't, right. I can't whistle. <laughs> we got three Starbucks gift cards, all right? We got one Starbucks gift card for one winner. Now, y'all know the rules, right? Y'all know how to do it? Y'all know how to do it? Let me see a test flip real quick. Okay, oh, let me see okay. a test flip. You get one test come flip, on. that's it. Get some practice. Okay, oh, okay. No. Okay. That's Wait. a little too hard, bro. Oh, he, does that count? Does that count? No, it's got to no, be on the it's table. Be on the table. It's be on the table. You got to have finesse, All right. bro. Our first contestant, we got Nate. If you want Nate to win, make some noise. Oh. All right, our second contestant, we got Kayla. Give it up for Kayla. And on the last contestant, we have Miles. Give it up for Miles. All right, me and Adam are gonna count down and y'all go ahead and do what you gotta do. I would say get it on the edge already, dog. All right, make some noise for them if you want them to win. All right, ready? Come on. Adam, ready? Three, Three two, two, one, one. let's go. Come on, come Start on. Miles. Start from the big cut, start from the big cut. Come on, come on. Here we go. I need some class. Come on, let me see some something. Technique. Let me see something, Don't come on. Going willy, let me see willy. something, come on. Okay. Okay, he got one, he got one, come on. Oh my goodness. You've been training. Okay, here we go, right nope, here. No, nope. You've been training your whole he life can't for do this. It. He can't do it. He every can't do essay, it. Every essay, every math assignment, go. every let's English go. Come assignment on, Nate. has been for this moment Come on, right Kayla. Here. Come on, Kayla. Nope, it's got to be the Come other on, way. Miles. What are you doing? Show me something. Oh, it's over. It's over. Did he get it? It's over. It's oh, over. I am so it's sorry. over. Y'all give it up for Nate. All right, Kayla, boys, you can go sit down. Go ahead. Good job. Thanks for time. playing, guys. Thank you for playing. Thanks for coming on. Up. All right. Y'all saw how it works. We're going to get three more people up here. We need here three we go. more. Here we go. Well, I, 
I think, yeah. I only called up the current. Kick someone off. Kick someone off. Hey, boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, boy. I, I don't want to. Yeah. All right, y'all saw how it works. All right. Our first contestant. Our first contestant. What's your name, sir? Mac. Mac. Everyone, give it up for Mac. Let's go, Mac. Come on. All right, Jordan. What's your name, Jordan? Jordan. Give it up for Jordan. All right. Uh, all right. And the last contestant is Azalea. Give it up for Azalea. All right, Adam. You ready? Let's count down then. Three, two, one. Let's get it. Come on. Let's go. Come let's on, go. Let's go. Let's go. We got one already. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Oh Here my we go. goodness. Oh my uh -oh. goodness. Okay, he's on it. He's we on two. it. We got two. He's on it. One more last one. I don't know what's happening. Oh, she's on the last one. What? Last one. Last one. Oh, it's over. It's it. over. It's over. It's over. You guys go oh ahead and sit gosh. down. Go ahead and sit down. Here's your prize. Hey, you guys, give, it go ahead give it up for him. Right give it up for him. Come on. All right, that's all we got for you. That's all we got for you guys today. But um, if you haven't already, make sure you follow us on Instagram. All right. And make sure you sign up for Remind. If you saw on the screen, text those letters. Can we get that reminder up? Text those numbers, those letters to that number, and you'll get reminded. And you'll also enter a raffle to win something. So make sure you sign up, all right? And uh, I hope you guys brought your Bibles today because it's worth points. So uh, make sure you bring that. But follow us at Vintage Students. And we're going to transition into a time of prayer. So everyone, stand on up because we're going to worship God. Come on. If you guys would like to bow your heads and pray with me, let's do it. God, thank you so much for this family. Thank you so much for today. Lord, please let us open our hearts. Lord, please speak to us and speak through Michael today and open our hearts through worship. In Jesus' name, I say amen. amen.
to get together right now in your house, in your roof, in your room, God. I just pray that as we sit through Michael's sermon tonight, that you encounter every kid in this room and that when we go to school the next day and the next week, that they can just share their faith with all their friends and their family. So God, I just pray that you let your truth be told tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hello! Fancy seeing you here. Welcome to Youth Career. My name is Michael. Uh, we are in the book of Colossians. So if you have a Bible, uh, as, you, as you know, we're doing Bible stuff today. So if you have a Bible, go to Colossians chapter 1, okay? Take it out. Turn there. But as we get started, uh, you know, there's been something I feel like I've been needing to tell you guys for a long time. I'm sure many of you are already aware of what I'm going to tell you. But it's something of uh, national importance and it's the following. Birds are not real. Birds are not real. Okay? Now people, people are going to tell you that birds are real. And they're wrong. They're wrong. And here's why. Birds stands for Bionic Information Reconnaissance Drones. Okay? Beyond, now, okay, so get this. From the years of 1959 to 2001, the U.S. government got rid of all 12 billion birds in the United States, okay? They replaced them with drones that have been watching your every movement. Don't believe me? Have you ever seen a baby pigeon? No. What? Think about this. Think about this, Okay. How come you're not supposed to touch electrical wires because you'll get electrocuted, but birds can sit on them, huh? It's because they're charging, okay? Some of you are already believers in here. You already know the truth, okay? You know the truth. Birds are not real. Still, still, still not with me? Check out diagram A. Diagram A, okay. This is what's going on inside of every pigeon, okay? There's cameras, microphones, speakers. There's a CPU in there, battery. Inductive charging coils for when they actually sit on the telephone wires. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, I've been lied to my whole life. You have. Birds are not real. Okay? They have wireless intended to transmit all of your movements back to the, the government. Still don't believe me? Okay. Why do birds hang out in parking lots, huh? Seems suspicious. How about this one? Why do birds fly south for the winter? Because their gears would freeze. Think about it. My final point is this. If it flies, it spies. What can I say? I fell down a deep, dark hole of birds' conspiracy theories. Anyone else? No, the rest of you are like... Uh, I thought I was coming to youth group today. Not a birds aren't real rally. Well, you were wrong. Welcome to the rally. Free t-shirts on your way out. That's right. That's right. No. I'm kidding. I really am. And honestly, if birds weren't real, I wouldn't be surprised. But clearly they are. Evidently they are. Here's the deal. The reason I tell you guys this is because as much as it's kind of fun to poke at, there is so much ridiculous information out there. Can we agree? You guys remember when people believed in like flat earth? Yeah, yeah back in Galileo's time and 2018 for some reason? They're like, oh yeah, well if the earth's not flat, how come cars look like this? Hmm? Huh? Huh? Explain that to me. Like, it's, it's astounding how just much information is out there and how much just blatantly false information is out there. Furthermore, that there would be people that would even believe some of this stuff. Like, I had a barber who was a legit flat earther. Not kidding. Went to go get my hair cut, and the dude was like, had a map on the wall. He's like, you see that map? If the earth was round, why is it flat? <laughs> I'm like, 
he now lives in Grass Valley with his crystals. Um, <laughs> sorry if you like crystals. Anyway, <laughs> how do you know, how do you know what's true? How do you know what's true? These are two like kind of ridiculous examples, but I mean, you can just think back over like, oh, I don't know, last 18 months. Like, how do you know what's true? How do you know what to believe? How do you know what's right? How, how do you know wh what to follow? The reality is, is that we live in a world of competing voices. We live in a world that says, this is the truth, this is the way to do life. And then the next day, we run into somebody else who says, no, they're wrong, this is how to live life. You guys have probably heard different perspectives of like the point of life, whether or not there's a God, whether or not like why you're here on this earth. You probably hear a different version from your teachers, from your parents, from your youth pastor, from your small group leader, from your friends, from whatever influences you're following on whatever platforms. There's so much different competing truth out there. And here's, here's the problem with where we're at as a society. Is truth, truth has already been on trial and truth has already lost in the world's minds. In the world's minds, what we've done is we said, you know what, there is no truth. There is no one thing to believe. There is no one thing that's always true that which we can measure everything by. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And the word truth has devolved from what it was ever meant to be. But this book that we're in, this book, this letter to the Colossians, the main issue, the main question at hand in this book is the issue of truth. And I don't, I don't think there's something more apropos that we could look at together as a youth group for the next few weeks than this issue. What is truth? How do you know what's true? How do you know that birds, in fact, are real? So what do you do? Where do you go? Where, where do you go when you first go to look and find out what is true, what is, what is right? Maybe for some of you, you asked a trusted friend. For others, you have handy-dandy Google, so what's the point of actually having a conversation with another human being? For others, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a trusted mentor, but where do we go for truth? What I believe and what I've found is that this Bible, the, the one that maybe you have in your hand tonight, this Bible, this word that we believe is from God, I fully believe with all my heart that everything in this is true, that everything in this is the word of God. But I didn't get there because somebody told me it was true. It wasn't because someone said, hey, this Bible's true, you should believe it. And I was like, okay, thanks, sir. Like, I actually had to look into it myself and study myself and learn about it myself. And where I landed as a result of that is on a foundation that says, if something's true, it belongs to God. All truth belongs to God. If we find something that's true, let's say, let's say you're studying psychology and you discover something about the way that we're wired, about how, oh, I don't know, if you're, if you're more thankful, you're more happy. If you discover that and find it to be true on a biological level and on a psychological level, it's amazing. The Bible said to give thanks in all things. It's almost like, God's already said it. And any truth that we discover, it's always just God's truth because all truth belongs to him. But what we need to be able to navigate this world, what we need to be able to navigate society is a lens, uh, some parameters from which we determine what's true and what's not true. I'm gonna give you that at the end. And it's an acrostic, just like the birds thing, okay? I promise it's gonna be more memorable, I hope. Anyway, let's actually get into the text here because what we see at the top of this is the question of truth. Verse three, chapter one says this. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we have heard of your faith in, the, in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of this, or because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Let's stop there actually. Sometimes we might take for granted the opening of a book in the Bible, right? Especially if it's a letter from Paul. Paul's a guy who didn't love Jesus, began to love Jesus. It's interesting that he says, I thank God for you. Weird, right? Why don't you just thank God for God? Or why don't you thank God for your food? Or why, why do you thank God for other people? And I think part of the reason behind why Paul is even thankful for what these people are, who these people are that he's writing to, is because it's incredibly rare to find people that actually believe in the truth. It's incredibly rare to find people who actually believe in like what God has said and what God has invited us into. And so when Paul says, I thank you, it's a deep heartfelt 
thank you. This man was traveling around this entire region trying to convince people of the truth of God, the truth of what Jesus had done. And so he says, I thank you for this because you have something called faith and you have love. And you have faith and you have love because of a hope that you have. Now for us, maybe, maybe you didn't come in here thinking that much about hope. You're like, oh, do I need hope? What's, what's the point of hope? Most of us, when we think about hope, it's like, I hope I make it through the first day of school. Anyone? Amen. You guys had your first day. God bless you. And all those syllabuses. Syllabi? Yeah, all your syllabi. Hope you don't lose them. Uh, except for you guys, you probably have them online now, right? I'm, they didn't have that when I was a kid. Okay, I had to hold on to my syllabi. You guys get in your syllabi, you go in there, you're like, I hope there's not a lot of homework this week. I hope, I hope I find my friends at this massive campus. I hope I pass AP US history this year. Come on, somebody. Ugh, nasty. All you juniors know. The rest of you are like, what's that? And all the seniors who already took it are like, <laughs> when we hope in things today, a lot of times they can be kind of like trivial. But some of our hopes, they can be found in like legitimate things. Like maybe, maybe we hope that a relationship works out. Maybe we hope that our parents make up. Maybe we hope that we, we actually get our head on straight and we find something true in our life. Like we have hopes that are legitimate too. But the hope that Paul's talking about in this verse, the hope that these people had, it was found in truth. Now, can you hope for something and be wrong? You guys ever had that happen? Yeah, like, like there were times where I would hope I would pass a math test and I wouldn't, right? It doesn't matter how much you hope that you pass a math test. If you don't know the answers, you fail, Right? Great, you guys are with me, okay? Look, it doesn't matter how much you hope in something. If it's not true, your hope is useless. So on many levels, if the Bible wasn't true, any hope that we have in Jesus would be pointless, right? The, only, the hope is interconnected to truth. It's inextricable, inextricable from truth. You have truth and you have hope. If you don't have truth tied to the hope, the hope doesn't matter. In the same way, you could, you could not know the truth and you would absolutely have no real hope because it's not founded in truth. So this faith and this love that they have, it's founded in a hope. And the hope that they have is this. The rest of verse 5, he says, Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, the word of the truth, the truth. What's right? What's the straight edge from which we measure everything by? He says, We've heard the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day that you heard it and understood the grace of God in what? Truth. Should be on the screen. Yep, in yellow. You guys got that? Awesome. You're with me. Great. Truth. When I, uh, when I was in high school, I was, I was going to the youth group and my pastor got up and we were doing this series where we like talked about other world religions, okay? And so he went through all kinds of different world religions. He's like, okay, here's what Hinduism's like. Here's what, you know, Jehovah's Witness believe. Here's what Buddhists believe, Mormons believe. He went through the whole deal, Catholics, whole deal, all these different world religions. And then he said, look, any, any, any religion that looks at truth and bends the truth just a little bit, the truth being the word of God. If it bends the truth a little bit, he said, it's a cult. It's, it's, a, it's a lie. It's, it's a twist on the truth. And, and many people believe a false truth. And so me as a 10th grader, armed with this knowledge, I go into my English class, right? Dun, 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 right? Okay, I was like ready to go. And so the teacher's like, hey, you know, like ask some sort of stupid religious question in public school. And I was like, I believe that anything that is not Christianity is a cult and a, and a perversion of the truth. That's what I believe, okay? And so you guys are clapping. You're, you shouldn't, okay? Because here's the thing about the truth. The truth is a hammer, okay? The truth is a hammer. And with a hammer, sometimes everything can look like a nail. Everything is not a nail, okay? My 10th grade English class was not the nail to hit with that truth hammer, okay? So I dropped that thing, and everybody in class turns around and looks at me. I've got, you know, we, I went to Vandon High School, Travis Air Force Base. We were a bag of Skittles, okay? There's people from every background, every belief system, every everything. And they look at me like, did you just say I'm in a cult? And I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> 
And, and it's, it's funny to laugh at now, but what's not funny is I became the cult boy in that class. And it was like, oh, he's the guy who believes we're all in a cult. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> You're the one in the cult, buddy, right? Like that. See, I may have known the truth. I may have even known the right answer. I actually still, I still believe that to this day. If, come see me if you want to disagree. I'm ready. Um, I, I still believe that to this day. But the timing of that was totally wrong, right? And actually what it did is it compromised my ability to tell other people about the truth. Because it started with, you all are wrong. Not a great place to start. In fact, my teacher tried to deconvert me from Christianity after that. I've only found out later when I was like thinking of the books he gave me. He's like, hey, you should read this book called Anthem by Ayn Rand. I was like, cool, philosophy. He's like, it's going to be great. It's all like anti-Christian propaganda. It's like about people who like lost technology to make a light bulb, but they suppress them from learning it. And it's like about how religion is oppressive. And I was like, this is kind of a cool book. And he gives me Atlas Shrugged, which is even more like atheist propaganda. And I was like... I don't understand what you're trying to do to me, Professor, sir. <laughs> it's great. I was 16. 15, 16. Yeah, you guys know what it's like, 16-year-old kids. Here's what I'm telling you this. I may have had a foundation of what the truth was. I may have known what the right answer was. But, but truth is something that I think has to be handled with care. And so you could know the truth of the gospel. You can know what it says. But you could actually do more damage than good sometimes, depending on how it is that you share it with people. But what is so important about this verse here, and the reason why I'm saying this is this. He's, it's because Paul says that the truth that they knew, the truth that they knew was going throughout the whole world, okay? That all around them, people were discovering this truth. But what happened when they discovered truth wasn't this hammer and everything was a nail. What happened was, is the Bible says that they were bearing much fruit. They're bearing much fruit. That's weird. We don't say that today, right? Yes, I went to school today and I bore much fruit. It was increasing. I bore, what does it mean? Okay. To bear fruit means if you have an apple tree, what comes out of the apple tree? Apple. Guys are geniuses. Pears. The only reason a pear would come out of an apple tree is if you grafted part of a pear tree onto an apple tree. And then you might actually get pears out of an apple tree. But it's only if you graft it in and if the graft takes, for that matter. But... Fruit comes from fruit trees, right? So if you have a fruit tree, it's going to bear fruit. If a fruit tree doesn't bear fruit, what's the point of it? Cut it down. George Washington, cherry tree, cut down. Okay, no fruits, not, it doesn't matter. You think I'm making it up? Jesus said that. Okay, really weird story in the New Testament. He's walking to Jerusalem, and he sees this fig tree, and he's like, why don't you have any fruit? The fig tree's like, I'm a tree. And he's like, Poof, and he kills the tree. It's crazy. Check it out. It's metaphorical, okay? It says the truth, the truth is meant to bear fruit in your life. So get this. If you knew the truth, but your life didn't look like you knew the truth, do you really know the truth? Because if you know what's true, ideally, you organize your entire life around what's true. When I discovered when I discovered that showering was the only way that a female would talk to me. <laughs> Wife, hi, I love you. We got married. Because I learned that showering is the first step. Amen, boys? Hey. Junior highers, that's your takeaway tonight. All right, junior high, you're going to take that home? You're like, mom, 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 mom. I learned that to get married, I need to shower. And she's going to be like, I've been telling you this for years. Okay? I, once you learn the truth, you organize your life around it. Right? Great. When you learn the fact that gravity exists, you realize, mm, I'm not going to jump off of ledges unless you're a junior higher. Again, I'm sorry, junior hires. I'm just, it's okay. When you know truth, you organize your life around it. You start to look like you know truth. You can think about this in the realm of like health and fitness, right? You can know truth, meaning like, I know that what put, I put into my body is going to impact my caloric intake and what all my macros are going to be and ultimately what my body is going to look like. And if I don't exercise, it's going to get all messed up. You can know truth. But if you don't act on truth, it doesn't matter. Like me, for example, okay? I lost 50 pounds in like 2019. Stupid, just 50 pounds. And then I gained 50 pounds in 2020. And now I've gained another 10. So that's 60. So do the math, guys. I beat my personal lap record. Let's go. But, what, but here's the deal. I may know the truth. I may know what not to do, a.k.a. keep eating DiGiorno's pizzas by myself. But 
unless I organize my life around the truth, it won't bear fruit, right? But the same is true with the truth about Jesus. If we know it's true, if we know that there's a way to live that's better than the way that the world is selling us to live, but we don't organize our life around it, what's the point of the truth that you know? If you don't realize that you've been forgiven in Christ, and so you ought to forgive others to the same degree that he has forgiven you, if you don't live that kind of forgiveness, do we know truth? If you know that, that God has loved you even when you were an enemy to him, even when you were against him, but you don't love other people who are barely an enemy to you, do we know truth? The people that Paul's writing to knew truth and it was bearing much fruit, meaning they looked like they knew truth. He says, just as you understood this grace of God and truth, just as you learned from this man named Epaphras, verse seven, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the spirit. He's saying, look, you people, you have a love that is characterized by something other than yourself. That's what the truth of the gospel does. It teaches you to love your enemies. Like I just said, that isn't the meta for the world. The way of the world is not love your enemies. The way of the world is put your enemies down. The way of the world is get one leg up over your enemies. The way of the world is be superior to your enemies. But the way of Jesus says love your enemies. And so the love that they had was a love that was characterized by this love of the spirit, this love that came from the truth of the gospel. This issue of truth was pervasive then, and it's just as pervasive now. They were running into the same kind of trouble that we do, where things try to infiltrate what we believe, and we begin to believe things that the culture say are true, that the gospel never said. So Paul's bottom line is this. He says, I'm thankful that you know the life-changing fruit of the gospel, the life-changing truth of the gospel. He says, I'm thankful that you know that. And so my question for us tonight is this. Do you know truth? Do you know truth? And if you were to say that you knew truth, you know the truth, how would you know that you know truth? Okay, I'm sorry. I know we're getting way theoretical, okay? This is called epistemology, the study of how we think, what you believe about what you believe. You with me? Metacognition, it's happening right now. Okay, how do you know something is true? Here's a lens. I made, I made this earlier today, Hunter. Help me come up with it by hyping me up, okay? What, what we want to do is I want to give you guys a little way of testing, okay? How would you know if something's true? Here's so you can remember it. Truth. Wow. Amazing. I know. I know. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Okay, here we go. Truth. Is it testable? Can you test it? Can you test it? Like gravity. Can you test gravity repeatably? Yes. Does it always pull things down to the earth at 9.8 meters per second? Yes. Good job. Is it reliable? Does it happen every time? Can you count on it? Can you count on whatever truth it is that you believe? Is it useful? Does it actually work? Does it actually work? Does, does, does what you believe about gravity actually work? If you were to practice what you believe about gravity, does it work? For the most part, yes. Is it timeless? Does, does gravity happen no matter what? Like, is gravity something that, that happens whether or not you lived 50 years ago? Is it something that happened whether or not you lived 2,000 years ago? Yes. Does gravity produce heart change? Technically, cardio, right? <laughs> Wouldn't work without gravity. Take that, outer space. But think of it this way. This lens of truth, let's, let's just apply it to the gospel. Let's, if, do we buy that this is okay, this is an okay test? If something passed this, we could pr probably reliably say, okay, that works. Let's just try it with the Bible. Let's try it with the Word of God. Is it testable? Can we test the Word of God? I think so. If God says it's better to give than to receive, we try that and we notice that, hey, actually, this, this, this is better to give than to receive, then, okay, we can test that out. Or maybe we can test out some other things that the Bible says. The Bible says that the days of man are numbered, meaning that humans die. Do humans die? Yeah, okay. There's plenty of things you could test out there. Well, how about this? Did you know the Bible, the Bible, the New Testament alone, what we have from the New Testament alone, we have over 44,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. Do you know that? That's a big number. That's more than there are people in El Dorado Hills, okay? Out of those 44,000 manuscripts, none of them disagree on any singular major theological concept. Furthermore, 
out of those 44,000 manuscripts, what we have is the New Testament. That amount of manuscripts is unparalleled with any other ancient document. Did you know that you, most of you guys heard of Cleopatra? Yeah, you had to learn about her, you know, Mark Antony and your Egypt project in fifth grade. Okay. You believe she existed. You, guess how many manuscripts that we have about her from that era within like, oh, I don't know, 200 years. Not anywhere near 44,000, okay? And, but, we, but, we, but we teach that in school, right? What's our, what's our method of testability? Well, if we use something like manuscripts, dude, the Bible crushes every other type of ancient book. If we looked at even just like what the disciples did, these, these 12 people, minus Judas, he doesn't count, but add Matthias in the book of Acts and we're chilling, okay? So you've got these 12 people who all said they believed in Jesus and every single one of them, not a single one, recounted what they said. And every single one of them, except for John, died for their faith. Peter, tradition holds that he was crucified upside down. Tradition holds that Thomas went toward the east and he was beheaded. John didn't get killed, but he was literally dipped in boiling oil. James was beheaded in a Colosseum. All, all, all these men chose to be martyred. Don't you think that at least one of them would have been like, mm -mm -mm. nope, it was a joke, please don't kill me. But they all, they all just kept going with it. It's fascinating. It's, it's something that's, that's proven. This is what these people did. Also, we have this other strange thing that happens in the New Testament. Did you know that ladies were not allowed to give a testimony in court in the first century? It didn't count as a witness. Do you know who found the empty tomb first? Women. Women. Come on, ladies. Give a whoop. Whoop. That's right. First off, God's like, pfft. I don't care. Women are epic. They're going to see the tomb first because typically girls understand the gospel first anyway. Boom, roasted. And so the girls go and they're like, ah, Jesus is alive. And they go and tell the boys. And you know what the boys do? Uh-uh. They didn't believe him at first until finally like, Peter's like, sure. Well, I'm going to go see for myself and runs down there. Didn't even believe the girls. Typical guy, okay. Just runs to the tomb and he's like, it is empty. If you're coming up with a legend that you want people to believe and someday give a bunch of money to, don't you think, don't you think you wouldn't choose women to be the ones that find Jesus? And yet, and yet, it, that's, what G, that's what God chose. It's fascinating. There's dozens of things we could go through on the word of God and how reliable it is. If you want to, come, come talk to me. I'd love to. But here's the deal. It's testable. You can go back and look at these events in history. There's a guy named Josephus. He wrote a book called Antiquities. It's all about the Jewish history. It corroborates the story of Jesus. And he didn't believe in Jesus. Most of what we know from Roman history in that era is from a man named Josephus. And he, wrote, he writes about Jesus. It's fascinating. Is it testable? Is it reliable? If you try to do the things that God calls you to do, do they mostly work? I'd say they do. Everything that I've done where I'm like, okay, God says, you know, I'm going to put away things like, oh, I don't know, malice and sexual immorality and earthly passions and covetousness. I'm going to put those things away. I'm going to get rid of obscene talk. It's always worked out in my benefit. Every time. This is all in Colossians 3, by the way, if you want to keep reading ahead. Every time that I've said, okay, it says put on, then as God's chosen and beloved ones, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another as God's forgiven you. Every time I've done that, it's worked reliably. It's something that I, I can do, that, that I can count on, but then also it's useful. It actually works. If you just threw away all the like believing in God stuff and just tried to do the ethical teachings of the New Testament, you'd actually have a pretty good shot at being a decent person. You'd be missing the Holy Spirit filling your life, but a lot of the foundation of even Western civilization is based on these truths that are found in Scripture because they're actually useful. Because the God who wrote them created them for us to walk in. It's fascinating. Is it timeless? People have been doing the way of Jesus since the way of Jesus. Whoa. That's deep. Think about it. Thank you. Thank you. She can stay. Okay. The rest of you go. Just kidding. Look. People have been doing this thing reliably for the last 2,000 years. 
And get this, every time we rediscover the basic things that Jesus did, it's always better. Think about the Reformation in the 1500s when we went back and said, okay, sola scriptura, sola Christus, sola fide, sola Deo gloria. Like when we said the five solas, we said, let's, let's commit to those. It worked every time. It's been timeless. And then the one thing that I think always sticks out to me about the truth of Jesus is it actually leads to heart change. I'm constantly amazed at the way that, that you see people come to Jesus and they're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this God thing. And a lot of times when we start to follow him, we're like, you ever seen like a baby colt? I think it's called a foal, like a baby horse, you know? When they try to walk, they're like, they just said like, what, what's going on here? When we come to Jesus, a lot of times we walk like that. We're like mm, trying to figure out how to walk. And then like slowly we start to build up strength and, and we start to learn how to walk like him. And then before we know it, we're just like, just like thoroughbred horse, just like, just like going around the arena. Like it's amazing watching that happen time and time again. I've been doing this 11 years now. Whoa. I've been doing this whole youth thing 11 years, and I've seen time and time again people come to an understanding of Jesus and then start to kind of like stumble into figuring out how to do it and then just take off. And I've seen people's hearts completely change, like people who had massive addictions, that just letting them go, people who, who were angry before, finding joy and happiness in Jesus, people who had, who had never really practiced forgiveness, finally going and forgiving people. Like I've seen massive heart change in people's lives. I've seen it in my own heart. I've seen myself go from this apathetic little punk to somebody who actually cares about people, who's actually compassionate. That's not something I would have probably arrived at if it was just me and my Ayn Rand philosophy books. You guys, the gospel, the truth, it leads to heart change. If something doesn't match this parameter, I'd get rid of it. I'd throw it out. But everything that I've seen in scripture, it matches, it lines up. I've seen and I've found it to be truth. And so that's what I want to challenge you guys with. As you go through life, as you're trying to figure out what do I believe, what's true, what's not, are birds real, and other stupid things, but more serious things like, oh, I don't know, mm, should I be really focused on, on getting out of high school and going and making a difference with my life, or, or does, does nothing ever actually matter? which might be something that you're told. Or maybe, maybe other things where you're saying, you know what, hmm, maybe my value, maybe my value is found in what people think about me. Maybe my value is found in my followers on social. The Bible would say, no. Truth of gospel would say, you matter because God says you matter. And because of that, who you are as a person is valuable, no matter how many likes you have. You guys, the truth of the gospel consistently, time and time again, leads to these things. And so that's my challenge to you tonight in small group. Dive into Colossians, open it up, test it, see if it's true. I love you guys, let me pray, and then we'll go to small group. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for tonight. I pray that, Jesus, your truth would reign in our lives. That when we do come against things and try to, try to navigate culture, that's gonna tell us that your word isn't true or it's gonna tell us that you're not real or that you, that you don't exist, God. I pray that, that your truth would reign and that we would see just how reliable you really are. We'd see the ways that your gospel works, the heart change that it can produce in us time and time again, Jesus. We love you. We thank you for who you are. We pray this in your son's name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.